Yes. I think actually the, the oh, answer, yes. okay. answer is yes. 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 And um, but I will start with a very big picture: uh, 300 years of energy history. So take uh, take your time to look at this, because you will observe here that all the end user segments, buildings, transportation industry, they will achieve increased access to energy going forward. And even good news for every megajoule or gigajoule you are using, you get more energy services out of it. So it's even more than it looks. Because in metal production, we will have more secondary steel, aluminum, etc. So we get more kilos per megajoule or gigajoule. But also for light, for everything, we get much more services. So this services that you see here is more than enough to generate wealth development for 10.4 billion people in 2090. But still, you see on the top line that is primary energy. And that is soon going to peak and decline. And this is something that people really have a hard time to understand. People think that primary energy will scale with GDP. And this is one of the big mistakes by many people analyzing the energy market. Because what we are facing now, and the reason why it will peak and decline, is that we are facing the biggest revolution ever in energy efficiency. Since the transformation from molecules to electrons is really a transformation where we are taking away two-thirds of the losses. So just look at this. This is 10 kilowatt hours. That's the energy content of one liter of gasoline. 36 megajoule or 10 kilowatt hours. So if you charge uh, your car with the gasoline, that will take you 17 kilometers approximately. You use one third of the gasoline. Two thirds is losses. With an electric car, you are getting 50 kilometers with the same energy, three times as, 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 as much. And similar pictures you will see when you're generating electricity from uh, coal or gas fire power plants, you are typically getting 40% efficiency on the electricity side and maybe are able to generate and use maybe 10 to 15% of the additional heat. But um, so a large part of the gray part here is losses related to fossil fuel. So, uh, and with this, uh, the, the, the primary sources of energy behind this is, as you see, that solar wind, as you mentioned, but also hydropower, geothermal, and biomass will outcompete gas, oil, and coal. And just looking at gas, oil, and coal, think about that. If when you're using this energy for work or for electric services, more than half of it is just losses. But with direct electrons, from the, that's the highest quality energy carrier, is electricity. Then you get much more electricity or, or much more energy to use, actually. But, and you see it's a quite steep energy transition, but it's not the first energy transition. If you look at the scale here, but let me help you to scale this up to 100%, then, then you will see that we have, have several energy transitions already, going from a society primarily based on biomass, that was completely exhausted in the 1850s. It was almost no forest left in Europe. It was an energy crisis. Coal came in and saved Europe and saved the world, enabled us to continue the industrial development. And coal was in all sectors, transportation, buildings, metal production, and after a while also in electricity generation. But in the 1940s and 50s, oil and gas came very suddenly into the market. And that was a quite abrupt energy transition, and I will illustrate that. And now we are facing the third big energy transition. So as you see here, this is the coal consumption in railroads in the US. It was 120 million tons in 1945. And people feared it was not enough coal to feed the transportation sector of the World War. Because people, people didn't see that, yes, there's a new locomotive coming, a diesel-electric train, but that is quite, uh, quite few in numbers, only 300 locomotives versus 30,000 of the steam locomotives. But in only 15 years, those diesel-electric locomotives completely outcompeted the, the, the steam locomotives, and it, you get a complete change of a huge infrastructure in only 15 years. By, by 1960, those steam locomotives was completely gone. 
So this just shows how fast a big energy uh, system can change with huge infrastructure. And you actually see the same in many industrial sectors, for example, going from open heart furnaces to electric arc furnaces that also took less than 20 years to change a complete big infrastructure globally. So things can happen very fast, even with big infrastructure systems. So, uh, and also one feature with a, with a fossil fuel uh, system is that you are better off, you get more energy if you're burning the molecule close to the user than burning it to make electricity. So it makes sense to have electric uh, to, to have gas heaters in the homes and to have gasoline cars when you have gas or oil that is used to produce electricity. So that puts an upper limit of the logic of having electricity, only like 20%. As you see here, 20% of the blue, blue part here, this is the energy carriers carrying the energy to the end users. And it doesn't make sense to have more than 20% of this today. But with renewable energy, suddenly it makes sense to electrify all the end-user applications. And, and, for, and, and this is only now it makes sense. In Norway, we have had that uh, already. So, uh, for, for, but that is an exception. No, almost no other countries is like Norway with renewable energy uh, for many, many decades already. So as you see, electricity will, will grow from 20% to 60, 70, 80% of the energy system. And this is a huge task to scale up the grid to carry this. And you could say, well, we have to expand the grid three or four times because we're going from 28,000 terawatt hours globally to more than 100,000 terawatt hours globally by 2050. However, you don't need to scale it three to four times. And there's several reasons. One is that it will be more expensive to upgrade the grid than to make local generation in very many places. So we will rather overbuild locally with local storage, then upgrade the grid to full liquidity. Point number two, that the, today's grid is actually usually underutilized. It's designed for peak hours, and it's designed with security limits that are quite restrict. But with digitalization, you can actually take much more power into the current grid as well. For example, uh, the, the temperature is the most important factor. The, co the colder, the more transportation you can have of electricity. And when it's blowing a lot, that cools down the cables, and you can actually extend the, the amount of, of power you can take. And that fits very well with the wind, the farms, etc. But then you need micromanagement of all these uh, security factors. So we need a lot of, you need basically to digitalize the whole grid. But you can get much more out of the grid than you're doing today. And by the way, Norway, Statnet, of course, you have a big task. But compared to other nations, Statnet is very well off, actually, because we have already electrified the end user segments. Uh, the, 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 the transportation fleet is, is not too much actually to, to, to add. Uh, so it's about industrial electrification that is the big task, which is so, so the task for many other uh, TSO operators globally is much bigger at least than for, for StuffNet. So in that sense, you are quite lucky. Okay, so this, what I showed you now, is one scenario called 1.6 degree global warming. Because this is associated with 650 gigaton of, of emissions. And I'm showing this because as we, when we are studying this and how fast solar and wind is implemented, this is the fastest, the most optimistic scenario I can see that I still can give a, 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 a good story that the supply chain will be able to deliver which is good news. I mean, I believe in 1.6 degree global warming because I see that the supply chains is ramping up fast enough. Um, but we, have, we are actually assessing all these different scenarios. This is from the excellent IPCC report. You see then 12 different scenarios from 150 gigaton of emissions to 2050 gigaton of emissions, which corresponds to 2.4 degree global warming. And we are making then complete scenarios for each of these, uh, for each of these uh, global scenarios for global warming. So for example, for the 1.4, 350 gigaton. For 1.6, 650 gigaton, which I, say, which I said this is the most aggressive I think is achievable. And this is a very conservative scenario of 2.1. And actually to get to 2.1, you need to slow down drastically the implementation of electric cars and solar panels. The pace today is much faster than this scenario, which is very unlikely that we will do. Maybe with a big crisis with China, this will happen. 
All of the scenarios also are going below the zero line, as you see, meaning that you have to have carbon capture and storage. You need 5,000 carbon capture and storage wells by 2050. But honestly, that is not very much. Every year, the oil industry is drilling 40,000 wells. And we need aggregated 5,000 by 2050. So we can do that, actually. But we, we have to be very kind of systematic to look at which technologies are going to take away this 38 gigaton of fossil fuel and additional 7 gigaton of non-fossil uh, uh, CO2 uh, emissions, as you see here. This is the categories used by, by the IPCC. We have this by country, so we can be quite, quite scientific about this. The biggest sector, as you see, is electricity and heat production. That's the biggest single uh, sector with 13 uh, uh, gigaton to be mitigated. And this is, here you see 7,000 coal-fired power plants, uh, 12,000 gas-fired power plant, that's the red part, and about 12,000 oil-fired power plant, that's, that's, the, that's the green. green. So these, basically, these uh, power plants need to be outcompeted by solar and wind. And we can track exactly how fast that can happen in each, each nation. So let's do that and, and look at which technologies will be used to mitigate uh, this uh, uh, fr from the electricity sector. And number one technology is actually solar. And solar alone will not only be used to mitigate the electricity sector as today, but also to electrify the other sectors as you see. So we see that color of solar is, is closer to the axis for all of this. Uh, number two is batteries, electric vehicles, and, uh, uh, and uh, CCUS. Number three is wind. Number four is, bio, uh, is geothermal. Uh, and number five is hydrogen to help you. But I can resort this to, to, to see easy the technologies here. And then we can track each of the, the, these technologies. What is the status? And I'll just show you a few of those now in the interest of time. But solar is the most important. And solar is leading. And solar is tracking slightly faster than expected one or two years ago when we started to make these scenarios. Wind is tracking slightly slower. Batteries is at expectation. Electric vehicles is also slightly faster than expected. So, uh, and, and this is one good illustration of uh, what solar can deliver. This is the best uh, solar plant, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, Al Dafra project, $13 per megawatt over. Even Norwegian hydropower is struggling to compete with this on the marginal cost. But this if you're charging your EV, you can drive 500 kilometers for $1.3 of marginal uh, cost. With gasoline, you need at least 30 liters, $30. So this just shows that at this best implementation, the new energy system is one order of magnitude more efficient than the existing fossil fuel. Uh, and that is why, the, so climate change is not the only driver. Basically, the new technologies are much more competitive. And that's why we have seen in the, in the electricity sector that for the last eight years, we have implemented globally already much more renewable uh, energy, uh, low carbon, than fossil fuel. So the energy transition is already happening in the electricity sector and has done so for the last five years. But solar is actually tracking faster than expected, as I mentioned. And the capacities to build solar is just ramping up tremendously fast. So we are following all of these uh, building of new factories by satellite photos, and you can actually see that we are tracking towards uh, more than enough capacity to deliver 1,000 gigawatt of solar implementation in the 2030s. And this is what we need to reach the 1.6 degree scenario. The big issue is, of course, that China is the key uh, supplier for all of this. This is a geopolitical issue. And we need to resolve that. And I'll just point on one way to resolve it. This is the polysilicon, uh, uh, this is the solar panel prices landed in America. With the polysilicon price fly up due to shortage of that, and shipping fly up during COVID. Now, with the Inflation Reduction Act, the, the, uh, it, it, it's a good business case to have on the ground polysilicon production, I mean, solar panel production in America. And this is now exploding with capacity. And they're likely to take up to 15% uh, market share by 2030. Europe hasn't matched this yet. I think we need to see something to match this also on the ba battery side. On the 
wind side, we are in the middle of a big crisis for wind. We don't see the business case. The inflation has been too high. But I think it, we see light in the end of the tunnel, or, tunnel also for wind. We see inflation starting to get down. We see a lot of new suppliers coming in that offer cheaper capacity, however, from China. So then we have that issue again. Um, but also we see radical new innovation. And here you see uh, one example of a radical new innovation that I think will come in the 2030s. You see, why should you have that turbine to build it light and have it 200 meters up when you can have it subsurface? Why should you have vertical rotators when you can have horizontal and then you don't need uh, to, uh, to, to have it that, that high up? And also, why not lean over like a sailboat to be uh, storm protection so that the whole construction can be much uh, simpler? So this is one example. This is the wind wall, another example with 120 turbines. Uh, this is the th uh, yeah. so, so these are a few examples uh, of, uh, of getting down the cost in wind. And then the only thing we need to get down then is storage technologies. And my last slides now are on storage technologies. And of course, batteries are quite well known. But uh, also the new thing where a lot of innovation is happening is in heat storage. So this is one example from a school in Drammen. They're having water-based panels capturing the summer heat, injecting that heat into the ground 200 meters down in wells, using that, and the, and the granite is then heated to 50 degrees, and they're using that uh, heat to heat the school in the whole winter. And even in the spring, it's still hot. So it's actually now we have year three, and it, the, 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 the stone is getting hotter and hotter. So this is one example of using summer heat for winter heating of buildings. And these kind of innovations is now taking off using geothermal. But also another, and this is my last slide, another <laughs> uh, innovation. This is called sun, sun in the box. When you have excess electricity, you're heating a graphite block up to 2,000 degrees. It will radiate like a sun, and you use solar panels to take electricity out. And the losses is only 40%. It's more than a battery, but it's much cheaper to build. So these are showing some of the innovative technologies that will resolve also the issue of intermittency for renewables. So we are tracking towards a green revolution. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.